Good afternoon, and welcome to Mass Family Voices webinar on emergency preparedness of, for families of children and youth with special health care needs. My name is Rich Robison. I'm the Executive Director at the Federation for Children with Special Needs, and we're happy to sponsor this event today and glad that you all are joining us. Um, recent hurricanes and other emergencies have reminded us all that we need to be well prepared. And so we thought it was very timely to have this particular topic offered today. And we're thrilled to be able to have uh, Sue Wolf Fordham, an instructor at the University of Mass Medical School and the Director of Emergency Preparedness Initiatives at the Eunice K. Shriver Center. Uh, Sue is a great expert and she comes to this with passion and family in interest as well as expertise. And so we're thrilled to have Sue join us here today. Thank you. I also wanted to say that I'm the parent of an adult child with Angelman syndrome. So I look at this both personally and professionally. And I thought we'd begin by asking your audience a couple of questions. The first one is how much do disasters cost the U.S. each year? The second question, about how many hours of training do you think emergency responders and emergency shelter workers get related to people with disabilities? So I'm going to have you be the guinea pig, Rich, so you guess. How much do disasters cost the U.S. each year? I'm sure it's in the billions with a B, but I have no idea. So it's about a billion a week, which is a fantastic sum of money and you can just imagine um, if everyone were better prepared what the savings would be around the country and so let me ask you um, the second question which is how much training do you think responders and emergency shelter workers usually get about people with disabilities or special health care needs? I fear to say that it's probably not very much um, my impressions are that we're often helping um, the safety personnel in our communities understand what the needs of our children are. Absolutely right. So while the situation is improving in many places, traditionally it's been a great big zero hours. So to me, that tells me how hard we have to work as parents of children with special needs to make sure our families are prepared, we're prepared, and we know how to interact with responders. So emergencies are all about disruptions, and as we think of our kids, we think about what happens when a daily routine is disrupted, what happens when supports and services are disrupted, what happens when infrastructure is disrupted. So if our children are blind and they're used to walking around by themselves but there's debris all over the ground because there's been a storm, that's infrastructure disruption. If my daughter goes to a day hab every day but the day hab is closed because of an emergency, that's a disruption. Now I have to stay home to take care of her. For many kids, if their daily routines are disrupted, they can have a meltdown. So it's very simple to, to think about this, simple and yet scary. Um, parents need to start thinking about what are the disruptions that could impact their children's lives. So help us then understand why you think it's so important for us to prepare in advance. So um, based on my research a number of years ago with parents of children with disabilities around the country, lots of us have experienced emergencies. So it's likely we're all going to experience a natural or man-made disaster. Natural disaster like a storm, uh, man-made disaster like a chemical spill or unfortunately um, terrorism. And today, of course, we could experience a technology emergency. So we know they're going to happen, we know we're going to experience them, and we also know from the research that planning in advance is doable and it helps you bounce back afterwards. And so to me, that's the biggest reason. You can feel in control, you as the, the family head, 
can feel in control, you can help your kids feel more in control, it can help you bounce back. And you can think about some of those disruptions and what it would mean to your individual child. So to me it's all about what I call what if thinking and planning. What if my child uses a motorized wheelchair? What if there's a power outage? What's my plan? That's an example of what if thinking and planning. And we have to kind of think through those steps for our own children. So in my daughter's case, she uses um, an iPad-based AAC program. What if there's no power? What if her communication and source of entertainment is gone? What's my plan? What's my backup? And I think that's the first thing parents need to think about. It's a, a misnomer to think it's about getting expensive stuff, although stuff can be important if you have the resources for it. It's really about that what if thinking and planning and those disruptions. And then it's about sharing need to know information. So my neighbor or responder is at the door. How do I quickly say what they need to know functionally about my kid? So if someone comes to my door and I say one of her diagnoses, my daughter's diagnosis is extrapyramidal choreoathetosis, the person at the door will go, huh? That's exactly what I just did. <laughs> and so if I say she walks using a walker or holding on to your hand, she needs that iPad not just to keep her calm but to communicate. I'm bringing her medicine. That's concrete information. It's functional information and that's what we need to think about. Now that said, I keep separately information about her diagnoses and things that a doctor or maybe a pharmacist would need to know, but you've got to be able to get that, info, that functional information out first. It, and another example, if the siren doesn't stop, he will scream. Very functional, very clear. My child is afraid of people in uniforms. Would you mind taking your hat off, Mr. or Ms. Responder? The other things besides the medical information and those quick kinds of elevator stories and then more detailed information, making a list of household contact information, meaning who are the people in our household, what are their numbers, you can put it on an index card, keep it in your wallet, put it in your child's knapsack, um, and also out of area contacts because we know that sometimes local communication is tough but out of area communication works better. So if everyone knows, yes. gee, if, if we can't communicate with each other, Aunt Elizabeth, who's in Seattle, will be the one we're all going to call. And she'll kind of keep track of everyone in the family. And a little bit later on, I'm going to show you where some of this is available on our, our website. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other thing I wanted to talk about was registries and the Massachusetts uh, indicator form. So registries are databases that some communities keep with information about their residents with disabilities. They are voluntary. Every town and its 911 service has something called the indicator, which is a form parents could choose to complete um, when there is a call from their home to 911, the 911 operator is going to see very brief, abbreviated general information about their child. So for my child, it would talk about a mobility disability, speech disability, cognitive disability, and that's it. Some people like to do these, to complete these forms. Some people don't. Um, there's also a split of opinion in the adult disability community because some people don't feel comfortable sharing that information. I wanted to let people know about it so they can think about it and there's an example of the indicator form in our toolkit um, which I'll talk about later on. If a colleague of mine who was a police officer were here, he would say he thinks they're great and he has a child 
with a disability himself. For me and my husband, it was a really difficult decision to make about whether and how to share information with our town about our daughter, even though my friend, the police chief, was telling me to do it. Next, I wanted to talk about supplies. So there is no need for fancy supplies, and sometimes fancy, super expensive, specialized supplies are marketed to parents. And I'm here to say it's just not needed. If, however, you can stockpile some food and bottled water, uh, first aid kit, some toiletry supplies, flashlight and batteries, which many of us have here because of bad winters. Um, something, if you have the budget to buy, would be a battery-powered or solar radio. You can get um, radios that actually will charge your phone without electricity, mm -hmm. and you can hear weather on the radio, and it's a regular radio. They're about $30, $35, very easy to find. And the other thing I would say is go to your attic and dig out an old-fashioned corded phone. It doesn't have an answering machine. It doesn't require electricity. It plugs into a phone jack. And if your house has a phone jack and you plug in that phone, often when power is out, as long as the phone lines don't go out as well, that phone is still doable. And I actually use that in my home. Um, we saved an old one. It has a Red Sox sticker on it from my son. And we bring it out when we have power outages. We also got a, a weather radio. Tools for turning off your utility. People probably already have that. A whistle to signal for help is inexpensive and good to have because often your voice gives out before your whistling ability using a whistle would help, uh, would give out. Um, keeping key documents, which I'm sure many uh, of people in the audience have already, birth certificates, bank account numbers, um, the IEP, keeping an extra copy, put, it in, put them all in a Ziploc bag or two and just have them available, um, and then cash. It's really important, if you can, to have extra cash so that you're not relying on credit or electronic banking if you have to leave your home. And lastly, and super important for our kids, have comfort items and distractions, preferably those that don't use electricity. So I interviewed a family that lived through the Central Mass snowstorm a number of years ago and their sons have autism so they like electronics and they had a lot of battery operated electronic type games that they knew their boys would like and the family kept them especially for emergencies so they would have that sort of uh, new game kind of look. Can you talk a little bit about how we stay informed and get information from uh, the city or town uh, when emergencies are occurring. So this is what really surprised me in my research. Every city and town in Massachusetts seems to want you to communicate with them and seems to want to communicate with you in a different way. So the best thing to do is call the local emergency manager or public health office and ask them about it. I've worked with towns that have an in-town radio station just for people who live in the town, and the town has decided they are going to share emergency warnings and alerts over the radio station. I've been in towns where they don't want you to contact them with 911 during an emergency. And then there are towns that text, towns that have email, towns that have reverse 911, cable, any manner of communication. So the big question parents need to ask is, how is the town going to communicate with me, and how do they want me to communicate with them? Yeah. And those are interesting um, and challenging uh, sometimes, uh, for instance, uh, a reverse 911 if the power goes out to the town exactly. isn't going to operate. Exactly. Some towns have multiple systems. 
Um, but that's a very good point, and that's mm -hmm. an important question to ask the town. And if for some reason the town hasn't thought of that issue, that's a good advocacy point for parents. But that's absolutely true. And the same with announcing if they're going to open um, an emergency shelter. They all have different ways of doing it. They all have different ways of telling you where the shelter will be. Um, and some towns disclose in advance and some don't. And by towns, I'm also including the cities in Massachusetts as well. I want right. to be clear, very varied. Right, cities and towns, those are our favorite things. Right. Yes. So given all of this, and you've identified that there's sort of uh, variability from city and towns, from place to place, we have so many jurisdictions in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there are laws in place also that perhaps offer us some continuity and things that we can ask for based on what the, the law requires. So for instance, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act comes to mind. How does Absolutely. that apply in these kinds of emergencies? So Title II applies to um, local and state services, including emergency services. So people with disabilities, and that includes children, are entitled to equal access to emergency services, equal opportunity. Um, that title doesn't use the word reasonable accommodations. It uses the phrase reasonable modifications. So people are entitled to reasonable modifications. And this law also applies if a third party like the Red Cross or Salvation Army is running um, a town or state shelter. Um, reasonable modifications have to be free and they're, they can't be waived unless they would fundamentally alter the nature of the program or pose undue financial or administrative burden and just high cost alone doesn't equal a burden. So the message for cities and towns and for advocates for people with disabilities is make sure your town is up to speed on their legal requirements and nothing beats advanced planning on the part of the city, town, and state so that responders and people who work in shelters and emergency volunteers know what their obligations are. It sounds like a really important thing to do. The other thing that comes up, I think, from time to time is that some uh, children with uh, disabilities might be using, or even adults perhaps, are using service animals. Mm -hmm. And in an emergency situation, for instance, if you go to a shelter, what are their rights or what are mm -hmm. the limitations about bringing a service animal with them? So this one question comes up in every single training I do on the responder and um, city and town side because there's a lot of confusion. And that's governed by the ADA as well. Um, and I'll talk about service animals first. Comfort animals are a separate issue. So under the ADA, there's only two types of service animals we have in the US, dogs and miniature horses. And I always say when I train towns, if a miniature horse comes, you call me, because this I would really like to see. Um, and when the person with the dog or the miniature horse shows up, say at an emergency shelter, there's only two questions that the person who's doing shelter registration can ask them. And one is, is the animal a service animal required because of a disability? And the other is, what work has the animal been trained to perform? It's not okay for the person at shelter registration to say, what's your disability? That's not That's one important. of the two questions. Mm -hmm. And service animals don't need a special tag or certificate or registration number. Um, they have to go where their owner is in almost all cases. We could envision a, a certain medical type situations that may be um, would be an issue, but in the shelter, wherever the owner of the animal goes, the animal goes, and towns have to figure out how to handle those people with service animals as well as those people with allergies to animals because both have rights. Comfort animals are a separate issue. Right. So 
let's say someone has Portia the pig, so not a dog, not a miniature horse, but Portia really is a comfort animal and the person who owns Portia loves to hold Portia, feels calm holding Portia, etc. Under the ADA, Portia is not a service animal. So under the ADA, Portia would not be allowed in the shelter. Yep. But cities, towns, counties, and states can broaden the definition of the kinds of animals that are allowed in the shelter so they might decide, you know, we really want people to bring their comfort animals mm -hmm. into the shelter. But under the ADA, there's very clear and strict guidelines. Right. And to just clarify that a little bit, the ADA is a national or federal law, and the states or local jurisdictions may be able to go above that. Right. They can't restrict it. But they can't it. restrict it. Yeah. Absolutely. And I look at it as a federal civil rights law. And frankly, I look at my work <clears throat> in emergency planning and response is the intersection of public policy and civil rights and public health. Mm. Um, so I think the advocacy component and the legal component is really important for parents to understand. So preparation seems to be the key over and over and over Thanks. again in this talk today and thinking these things through. Um, I'm wondering, uh, the photo that you're going to show us, is this a real photo or is that kind of a simulation of something? So that's very real. It's from Central Mass and it was taken during the big ice storm many years ago. And when I train parents, what I do is I blow up the picture really big and I say, picture your child here and then I stop while everyone laughs. And I think you, people need to know what a shelter is really like. It's like this picture. So it's crowded, it's noisy, um, it is supposed to be accessible, but not all potential shelter sites in Massachusetts are physically accessible. Um, you need to think about a shelter as a, a life raft, not a cruise ship. So what I would say to parents is, if you have friends or family you can stay with if you have to evacuate, I would choose that over a shelter if you can. If you have the financial resources to take a little vacation, stay in a hotel or motel, I would choose that if you can. If not, a shelter is going to look similar to the picture um, and it will offer the basics. And uh, just a word about medical shelters, we no longer have them in Massachusetts. So um, under the ADA and Olmstead, people with disabilities are supposed to be in the least restrictive environment. And so you cannot be um, turned away from an emergency shelter just because, in most cases, just because of a diagnosis. Now, if you have a contagious disease, that's a different story. Okay. But just because my daughter has Angelman's is not grounds for her to be turned away from a general population shelter. It's important to know because you can imagine that there might be somebody that feels uncomfortable who's in the shelter and may decide that. Happens this is, all the time. Yeah. Right. That's, that's my bread that's and butter. The, that's the deal. <laughs> okay. So uh, you and your child. Um, could get separated in this circumstance as well right. if there's an emergency. Um, what should parents um, do to inform the school or um, other kinds of, you know, probably school would be the most frequent mm -hmm. where the student is there for the longest periods of time, maybe parent is at work, and, and an emergency occurs. So um, I actually have done research on this and a lot of parents haven't had this discussion with school or service provider and even those parents who had the discussion came away often not understanding what the plan was. So I would say at the ISP meeting, the IHP meeting, the IEP meeting, 
any planning meeting for your child, ask what the school's policy is. I have unfortunately heard of policies in Massachusetts where the child with the disability would not be evacuated with the rest of the class or wouldn't participate in a fire drill and they would be kind of left to wait. And as a parent putting on my mom hat, I'm not okay with that. Right. And well, that, that certainly uh, often is okay under fire codes. Um, I would have a hard time with that being okay for my child or any child. I think our kids have to practice fire drills however they practice them. And in a real emergency, watching their classmates and teachers leave while they are left to wait for a responder just uh, it seems mean yeah. to me to do, putting well, aside the legality. Fire drills are, I think, a good um, illustration right. of the challenges. I know with my own son, when the alarm Alarms went off, off. Right. his tendency was to put his hands over his ears right. and hide under his desk and not want to go out into the hallway. And we had to work and work and work with our school to be able to figure out strategies right. to help him evacuate. It right. was very difficult. But imagine if that happened during a real emergency Correct. and he hadn't practiced and you didn't have the strategies, right. then it would be a, a worse situation. And I'm not saying that these are easy discussions with the school or with care providers. They're not. Um, but I think they have to be had, and in at least one state I know of, emergency information is put in the related services part of the IEP. That's form. a good suggestion. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, the other um, part of this is, I guess, actually talking to your own right. children about <clears throat> what to do and what how they can be prepared so that they don't um, react in such um, anxious or negative ways that they're not able to be able to um, effectively um, take care of themselves. So I think it really depends on the developmental age and abilities of your um, child and just in terms of exposing children to the news the research is pretty clear that less screen time is better because you don't want them replaying a disaster over and over um, in their head. So for example, after 9-11, experts advise parents turn off the TV so mm -hmm. that the kids don't keep seeing it. And then use language they will understand. Um, I don't think it has to be dramatic for planning because you use seat belts in your car, you, take, uh, you eat a healthy diet. There are all kinds of things we do every day mm -hmm. to keep safe and healthy. So um, a child who's able maybe can get a knapsack of supplies ready along with the family supplies or help in that way. Um, obviously for some kids, my daughter for example, we've had to make her bag for her, uh, but we made a social story mm -hmm. about emergencies and leaving. She participates in fire drills and certainly did at school and once we had to evacuate and she actually evacuated with us. Mm -hmm. If your child is able to be home alone or advocate for themselves, then you have to take a deeper dive. And they have to know that um, elevator story, they have to know how to speak to responders, and you probably have to practice it with them in advance. Interesting, yeah. Important things to think about. Well, <clears throat> we've touched on a lot of different topics. Um, what if families felt like they needed more information? Sure, so I'm holding this up and I hope the camera can see this. This is um, an emergency planning toolkit that we developed and the components are available on our website. So if viewers want to go to https colon slash slash shriver dot umass med dot edu and enter the term emergency preparedness. They'll see our resources for families. They'll see um, a medical information template, an emergency plan template, and fact sheets. And they are able to freely download them. Um, there's also a copy of the indicator form. There is a short version 
which is just all the planning templates, and then the longer version, which is the contents of the notebook that goes into these topics in greater detail. That's terrific. There is another opportunity to um, get this kind of information and to have a face-to-face -face experience with it. Um, Mass Family Voices at the Federation is sponsoring its annual Joining Voices Conference, Joining Voices 2017, on November 2nd um, uh, from 8.30 to 3 uh, that particular day. We'll be at the Edwards Meeting House in Framingham, which is the place we've been for a number of years, and people like the atmosphere there. Um, there are directions and information available on the Federation's website, fcsn.org slash MFV slash Joining Voices 17. And at that conference, we're thrilled that we're going to be able to have a presentation by staff of the Shriver Center on this particular topic and help people actually work through some of the steps of beginning their emergency plan uh, by using a template. I just wanted to add two things to that. I understand the venue is accessible. It is. Um, and also my colleagues Patrick Gleason and Nate Trull will be doing the, the training. Nate is a self-advocate. Um, Patrick is a colleague of mine and they will be giving uh, a longer version of the talk I'm giving today and then giving parents time to work through the emergency plan template and they'll be there to give advice. We're very excited to have you and appreciate so much your willingness to be here today with us to get us started on this uh, very, very important topic. You're very welcome. So thank you, Sue.